Brad Smith, welcome to Germany, and welcome to the stage. First, I want to say it's great to be here. I've been here many times uh, over many years. This facility opened in 2013, nine years ago. Um, but this is the first event we've had here since the onset of COVID. So we went two years without having people here. Um, I was last here in February of 2020. And I feel like we're all sort of coming out of what I would call a bit of a COVID cocoon. We've had to work from home. We couldn't travel as much. Um, and so now suddenly we have the opportunity to go places. We all get to decide where to go and how to interact. And this is a new hybrid event. So thanks to those of you in the room and thanks to those of you who are watching somewhere else remotely. Um, so much has happened when you think about climate over the past two years. It's really almost astonishing to me and that's really what I want to talk a little bit about, how we see it from Microsoft, how I think we all often think about it around the world. Um, so let me start with what I think of as sort of the basics. Look, we all know that the world faces a climate crisis, but I think it's good to remind ourselves that in so many ways the climate crisis is inextricably connected to what is fundamentally an energy challenge. It's an energy challenge that is of profound importance to the world because in so many ways the world runs on energy. You know, that is almost the indispensable uh, ingredient for every aspect of modern civilization as we know it. And it's worth just reminding ourselves of this. If you look at the last century, we've experienced unprecedented economic growth. But it's been driven by energy use. We need to keep that in mind. In fact, you see the correlation between economic growth and energy use. And to be honest, at least as we look at it, it's really not possible to think that we can continue to substantially grow the economy or prosperity without growing energy use as well. But that also defines the problem that we have. We have a big carbon problem. We're producing 53 gigatons of carbon every year on planet Earth. And as we all know, that carbon is what is in effect driving up temperature to a degree, a level that the planet, that humanity at least on the planet cannot afford. So the fundamental challenge we have to meet when you put those things together is actually very simple and straightforward, at least, to describe. We need to break the link between energy and carbon. We are going to need more energy, but we need to cut the amount of carbon that is being emitted from the energy we produce and use. And we're going to need, in short, to build a net zero global economy by the year 2050. And I'll talk more about what that means. But certainly before we dive into more of what it means, I think it's worth reflecting on the fact that this is an energy issue, this is a carbon issue, this is a science issue, but like all issues, it's also a people issue. We're going to need to bring people together in every country to solve this. And we're going to need to do one more thing that we were not talking about two years ago when I was last here. We've got to do this at a time when we actually have some real tension between short-term demands and long-term needs. You see that as a result of the war in Ukraine. Now, we're going to need to bring people together. We're going to need to reconcile the short and long-term needs. We're going to need great partners, and I'm excited here that we're part of a discussion today that not only has Microsoft and Deloitte, but the UNFCCC, the United Nations Framework, the Convention on Climate Change, the World Wildlife Federation. These are just examples of the groups that are playing leadership roles. All of that is sort of a frame, if you will, for me to talk a little bit about how we're thinking about this at Microsoft. And this is a little bit about us, but mostly I think it's more interesting, to be honest, for what it says for all of us. Well, 
we think at Microsoft about, well, what's our role here? I always start with our, well, our first role is to put our own house in order. We're a big company. We can afford to put our own house in order. Yeah, we emit around 17 million metric tons of carbon a year. We need to do better. So that's why it was in 2020, just before the onset of COVID, that Satya Nadella, our CEO, Amy Hood, our CFO, and I went on stage in Redmond, Washington, at our headquarters, and we said we would be carbon negative by 2030. And it was a big goal you know, for us. It was actually the first of four goals we created for our company. We basically said by 2030, we want to be carbon negative, we want to be water positive, we want to be zero waste, and we want to take steps to address the biodiversity needs of the planet. And I'll talk today really about carbon negative, but we have strong programs moving forward in all four of these areas. When I think about carbon or think about climate, it really is three things we've said. The first is carbon negative. What does that mean? Well, it means that by 2030, we need to cut our emissions by more than half, and then we need to be removing from the environment more carbon than we're emitting. And I'll talk more about what that means. The second thing we committed to do was to remove from the environment by 2050 all of the scope one and two emissions that Microsoft had made since the company was founded in 1975, which means we get carbon negative and we get more negative every year from 2030 to 2050. And third, we said we would put a billion dollars into a climate innovation fund. Now, one of the themes, as I'll talk about this, is all these pledges that companies have made. Here's the one slide that has way more words than you can possibly read, but if you're interested in it, we're happy to give you a handout, as I'll talk more about. In all four of our areas, we're very focused not just on measuring our progress, but reporting our progress. Because I just don't think that people are going to trust what anybody has to say without that kind of transparency and that level of detail. Nor do I think any of us will really make progress unless we hold ourselves accountable with these kinds of efforts. Now that leads me to the second of our five roles. And in some ways, I have to admit, I'm almost the most passionate about this because I believe it is the foundation literally for everything. And this is where we go from putting our own house in order to really embracing and championing, I think, a great cause and a great campaign that sounds sort of boring if you don't know much about it. But let me tell you a little bit about it and let me explain why I think the world should be excited and even passionate about this. We have to advance the ability to measure carbon emissions. Why? Well, you heard Liz, our moderator, say, you cannot manage what you cannot measure. Believe me, I've seen this throughout my career, now 28 plus years at Microsoft. I saw it for years as I worked to improve diversity, to stay to add more women to the ranks of our lawyers. We had measurable goals to do this, we, and we reported on them every year. And with that effort, we went from having 22% of our lawyers being women in 2002 to 50% 15 years later. But I saw other parts of our business and many other businesses lean into diversity without measurement. And what I consistently found was people who were passionate, who worked hard, and who didn't move the needle. Because if you don't have measurement, you always think that you're making progress because you care so much and work so hard. You've got to be able to measure things in order to actually manage them effectively. Now, if you look across our industry, the first thing I want to do is say, there's a lot of good work being done across our industry including by our competitors. Amazon's pledge, Google's pledge, Apple's pledge, Meta's pledge. In fact, you look around the economy as a whole, there are now 1,500 companies in the global economy that have made pledges. That's good for everybody. But it's also a challenge, because pledges will not save the world. Only progress will. And so what we really need to do is move from these carbon pledges to carbon progress. 
Well, what does that mean? Well, it takes us back to basics. Yeah, you know, we all talk about net zero, but I ask, when is net zero not net zero? Well, it's not net zero when, in fact, we're all using the same words but speaking a different language. We need to speak the same language. We see this all the time in the modern world in which we live. You know, people use these words, but if you actually listen, even among English speakers in different countries, people use the same word to mean different things. We're not going to get the planet protected the way it needs, the way humanity needs, unless we start to speak the same carbon language and stop using different words, to, or even the same words, to mean different things. And we've got to put this in the context of what I also call the four R's. At the end of the day, what we really need to do is get everybody on board and working together in an effective manner to record emissions, to report them, to reduce them, and then to remove some carbon as well. Well, one of the things I find working in a tech company is there's basically three ways that people talk with each other. One is using words, the second is using numbers, and the third is using pictures. If you think about Microsoft, that makes sense. We have Word, we have Excel, we have PowerPoint. Of course, what we really need to do, as you can now do with our products, is combine these things. But the key to getting the words right, it turns out, is getting the numbers right. It's fascinating. So you can't get people speaking the same language until you, until you get a common understanding of carbon math. And I know that most of you are probably familiar with this already, but I think it is worth taking 30 seconds just to remind ourselves that carbon math starts with defining and then dividing carbon emissions into three categories. There's scope one, the carbon we directly emit. If you drive a, an automobile that's powered by gasoline or diesel, then that's part of your scope one emissions, you emit it directly. Then there's scope two. That's the carbon that is emitted for all the electricity that you use. So if the electricity into your apartment or flat is coming from a coal-fired power plant or from LNG, yeah, that emits carbon that is part of your scope two emissions. And then there's this concept called scope three, which for almost everybody is the biggest. It's the most complicated. On many days, it's the most confusing. It really has two parts. The first is all the carbon that is emitted in your supply chain. If you're a company like that, Microsoft, that may be the concrete and the steel that's going into this building that we're renting. But for all of us, we have scope three emissions. Every time you buy a product in the grocery store, there may have been carbon emitted for the creation of that product. That's part of your scope three emissions. If you're in a business like Microsoft or any kind of business, you have the other half of scope three. This is the carbon that's emitted when people use your product. Well, it turns out laptops, phones, Xboxes, they all run on electricity. The more electricity they consume, the more carbon they're likely to emit. But of course, that's also a reflection of the grid. It may emit no carbon if the electricity that's being used comes from renewable energy, but it may be very different if the source of energy in a particular location is different. That just shows you how all of these things need to come together. We all need to understand the basic carbon math. But then we need to go from that carbon math to what I call carbon accounting. And here, again, the concepts can be very complicated, but can also be made pretty straightforward. Like all accounting that we know, it's like a ledger. There's two parts to the ledger. On the one side are what we emit. Think about it like what you see on many financial statements. But there's our emissions. There's the scope one, the scope two, the scope three. You add it up, you know your total emissions. Now, on the other side, are there is your removal, and that is nature-based removal or tech-based removal, but you can add up how much removal you have. But the key thing here, at least the way we think about it, is that what we're talking about here is carbon removed, not emissions avoided. 
What's the difference? Well, when Microsoft makes a purchase, as we do, we're the largest purchaser on the planet of carbon removal, that may say plant a tree that wasn't there or use technology like direct air capture to remove carbon from the environment and put it deep underground where it needs to stay for a very, very long time, ideally thousands of years, that's real carbon removed. What's carbon avoided? Well, I can go today and I may say, you know what, there's Carol Ann Brown, she's my chief of staff, she has a tree in her front yard. Carol Ann, I will pay you not to cut down the tree. That also happens a lot. Every time a tree stays in the ground and isn't cut down is a good day for planet Earth. But what did I just do? I offered her money to do nothing. I'll give you money if you just keep that tree growing. Guess what? That means that we've avoided some emissions, but we haven't actually removed anything. We haven't even done anything. And what we all know is that we're not gonna solve the climate crisis by doing nothing. We'll only solve it by doing something. And that's why the right side of the ledger is about removal, not avoidances. Now you put these things together and what does net zero mean? It's an arithmetic equation. When the left side and the right side are the same, you're at net zero. Now to put those in concrete terms, when you looked at 2020, the world had about 53 gigatons of emissions on the left and about zero of removal on the right. So by 2050, we've got to get net zero to zero. What that probably means is that 53 needs to come down to 15 or 10 or less. It won't get down to zero in all probability, which means we've got to get that number on the right up to five or 10 or 15 if we're going to achieve a net zero goal. So now we've gone from math to accounting. Then we've got to make the leap to the next step. Now we need standards for accounting. In other words, we all need to count the same way. If you're accounting one way and you're accounting a different way, then we're just going to be very confused. So we've got to move to standard accounting, and then that will be the basis for effective measurement. Does that sound hard? Well, it should, because it is. But I think that there's cause for optimism for one specific reason. We live in a world that has figured out how to do this for money, for financial controls. It's great that Deloitte is here. It's what they do. It's what big accounting firms do. It's what they do when they audit their customers, their companies. It means that we all have financial controls that speak the same language. And it's why people actually are confident when they read companies' quarterly reports. No one walks down the street after a company puts out its quarterly reports and says, is that true? Because everybody knows it's audited, it's regulated, and it's standardized. And you know what else it is? It's transparent. And so we need effective measurement that's transparent, which is one of the other aspects of this cause. It's why we're part of the business coalition that is working on this business ambition to try to keep temperature rises to 1.5 degrees centigrade. But the other thing that we're so passionate about, one of the things we've been working on during the last two years of COVID was launched earlier this year. We call it the Carbon Call. It's a carbon call that is designed to bring together businesses and NGOs and governments to work on the problem I've just described. That gets people to say, you know what, we'll help develop this. We'll work with the UN and international standards organizations, as you'll hear about today. We're committed to developing standardized accounting for carbon and we're committed to reducing our emissions, and we're committed to being transparent. So at the end of the day, the foundation for everything, I would argue, is about carbon math, carbon accounting, and carbon measurement. And if we don't have these three things, 
We'll all go to many meetings over the next year and years, and we will be excited, and we will be passionate, and we will argue, and we will debate, and mostly we will all be very confused because we actually won't know how we're doing. So we have to get this right. Now that brings me to the third thing we're trying to do as a company, which is move from the ability to account for carbon to the ability to automate it. Why? Because when you think about it, you can't manage what you can't measure, but you can't measure anything at scale unless you automate it. That's the way financial accounting works. That's the way almost everything in the modern world works. If we want to do it on a national basis, if you want to do it in a city, if you want to do it for the world, you better figure out how to automate it. So we have to put technology to work. What that really means is that the technology to automate the accounting needs to be designed in a way so everybody can record their emissions, so everybody can report their emissions to advance that transparency goal, and so ultimately people can use this knowledge as power to reduce their emissions. So the focus of technology emissions really, uh, sorry, of technology automation needs to be on all of those three things. So we've embraced this as a cause and actually as part of our business. We've created technology, a product, a service called the Microsoft Cloud for Sustainability. One of the things we're doing today is announcing that this will be generally available the 1st of June, meaning we've gone through a private preview, we've gone through a public preview, we've got, now got the product ready for prime time use. And what it's designed to do is bring data together so that any customer, a government, an NGO, a business can get its data, learn from it with insights, and then take action. Now, in some ways, that's a relatively straightforward thing. Think about it like Excel or any program you might have used to manage your money at home. It's basically a ledger system, but it actually is more and needs to be more in order to serve what the world needs. It, of course, needs to enable really a whole new generation of people who will fill jobs that are only now being invented sustainability managers of all forms and types with the information they need to report on carbon emissions. But there's two other things that the technology automation process needs to drive forward. The first is what we call at the thing that's needed at the core of all of this, a common data model. What is that? Well, basically, the way artificial intelligence works is it's fundamentally a couple of things. You create algorithms, and you have a data model. And the data model grows by adding more parameters, more things that can be measured, and more data. And the AI gets smarter and smarter as the common data model grows. What does that mean in this context? Well, what it means is that more as more customers use this, they all retain control of their own data, but the model gets smarter. The AI algorithms get more complex and therefore useful and sophisticated. And ultimately, it all generates better insights. Let's say you work in the automobile industry. Well, once you have a common data model, you can start to ask questions like, well, how do my emissions from the use of concrete compare with the average emissions for use of concrete in the automobile sector or steel that might be going into cars? You can start to compare yourself to an average. The common data model and the use of algorithms can also then start to make suggestions. Well, you might consider this step because what we've seen is that companies that are taking this step are making faster progress in reducing their emissions. And so what in effect this does is it gives everybody the ability to protect their competitive secrets, but also share learning with each other. It's based on the premise that we're all in this together and we all need to learn together how to reduce carbon emissions. 
But there's one other thing that we're trying to do that I would argue is as important or maybe more. <coughs> Ultimately, you can't have effective automation. You can't even have effective accounting. You can't even do real carbon math unless you build a real ecosystem around measurement. What does that mean? Well, first, let me describe how carbon accounting and carbon math are done today. Not very well, because it's all based on what is called cost-based accounting. In other words, if my employees spend a million euros on airfare, what I do is I go to a table, and it tells me, on average, how much carbon is emitted for a million euros of airfare. But what if I decided that I'm going to have 20% of my employee flights on airlines that are running those flights with sustainable aviation fuel? That means I'm emitting less carbon than average. But no cost-based accounting table will ever let me see that. Or even worse than that, in Microsoft's campus, where we're building 17 new buildings east of Seattle, we're actually paying more money to get greener steel and greener concrete. But cost-based accounting doesn't show that. In fact, it shows the opposite of that. It says we're spending more money on concrete and more money on steel. So it suggests that we're emitting more carbon, not less. How do we do better? Well, you have to create connectors and data APIs, application programming interfaces, and ultimately tools so that if your airline is running a sustainable aviation flight, you're getting the information directly from the airline about the actual carbon that it estimates was emitted for that specific flight. And if you're buying an amount of concrete, you're getting actual data from the concrete supplier. That's what the world needs. That's what we need to create. And then there's two final areas that we're focused on that I think the whole world needs to focus on. This is the fourth area. It's really about supporting all the innovation in new climate technologies. You know, the thing that I just find consistently fascinating is that we're going to need to invent our way out of part of this problem, a big part of the problem. We're going to need enormous innovation in climate technologies. We're not in the climate technology business ourselves. We don't build wind turbines. We don't construct solar panels. But everybody who does everything uses digital technology and needs to harness the power of data so they can invent and innovate faster. So more and more, I find, even during COVID, I was spending more and more of my time working with our customers that are at the forefront of innovation in wind power, in solar power, green hydrogen. We were in Africa in March. We went from country to country. One of the big topics with presidents and prime ministers and economic ministers was the future that they're pursuing for the development and production of green hydrogen. We work with fusion inventors. You just think about long duration battery storage. It's so important for almost all of this, but especially wind and solar power, electrical transmission. Today, we as a planet have the ability to put wind generation about 20 or 30 kilometers offshore. It's going to have to be farther, but that will require technological innovation in wind generation. And you think about these other things as well. This is the future. And we, I believe, should be optimistic about the advances that great companies are going to be bringing to life. And we're helping as well. I mean, first and foremost, we work with these companies and apply, provide the digital technology they need. But in addition, we launched a billion dollar climate innovation fund that focuses on investing in these advances. And we also have made a $100 million philanthropic contribution to Bill Gates' breakthrough energy effort, which includes work by the European Commission, as well as companies from around the world focused on early stage technologies, technologies that are so early they're not really able yet to attract capital on market-based rates, but they need money to get going. And then the last thing I'll just say is we're trying increasingly to use our voice 
to support the public policies needed to address climate change with four big areas in particular. One is public policies that will create more renewable energy. We can't even achieve our own goals unless we get public policy support that will bring more renewable energy to life. <clears throat> but second, we need to modernize the grid. Believe me, I'm somebody who's plugged something in probably every day since I was old enough to get access to an electrical power plug and relied on the electricity, and I never really thought much about the grid. I just knew that when I flipped the switch, something turned on, or at least it was supposed to. Today, we have to modernize electrical grids around the world you know, to more efficiently move green electrons from where they're generated to where they need to go. We absolutely need governments to help us with the globally interoperable reporting standards. And finally, I think we need to do all of this in a way that also addresses issues like climate equity and the needs of the global south. And if I wasn't sensitive to that before, believe me, after spending nine days going from Ghana to Nigeria to Egypt to Kenya, I appreciated that even more. We have a lot to do, but this is the future of humanity on this planet. And the final thing I'll say is like all great problems, it needs leadership. It needs role models, it needs great leaders, some of them will be countries. And Germany, I believe, will be at the forefront of the countries that already are and can and will lead the way. For those of you watching online, I think that, I think that was an endorsement of Germany's role. <laughs> <laughs> but I'll just say in closing, we hope to do our part too. I mean, we are committed, we are passionate, we're focused, we're transparent, we're gonna learn from our mistakes and we'll share that learning with you. But we're committed to getting this right because we really don't have any other choice. So thank you very much. On to the next part.